officially kick us off. All right, so a lot of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I am Sally Duplantier. I'm the founder of a company called Zing, and my mission is to help people live their best life longer through better nutrition, movement, sleep, managing stress, and finding joy in their lives. And I started this Wellness Wednesday program back in April, right near the beginning of lockdown. And I did it as a way just to help people stay healthy and connected. And I'm just delighted, really, that there's been so much interest in the program and that it's continued. And I think that one of the great joys that I have in hosting these programs is working with great thought leaders like Matt. So let me briefly introduce him. So Matt is a behavioral scientist. He has 15 years of experience applying behavioral science to solving practical problems. He's done hundreds of talks on this topic, including for places like South by Southwest and the United Nations. Uh, previously, he was a chief behavioral officer at Clover Health, and he, in his free time, which is hard to imagine, he works on side projects like representing the underrepresented. underrepresented uh, he worked with something called GetRaised.com, and I was thrilled to see that it actually helped women who were underpaid ask for and receive over $3 billion in back salary. Um, he's also the author of a book, Start at the End, How to Build Products that Create Change. And with that, I'm going to turn off these slides and I'm going to welcome Matt. Let me just turn this off here. All right, Matt, go ahead, please. All right. Hey, Sally, thanks for having me. Um, and hey, all, uh, as Sally mentioned, I have sort of an unconventional format for these things. So I know it's hard to have a conversation with, you know, 67 people and me over Zoom. But if you have comments, thoughts, questions, and you put them in the chat, I do have the chat window up on the side and I'll kind of respond in real time and incorporate those into the talk. Um, so Sally asked me to come by and talk a little bit about resilience. Um, and in particular, resilience, you know, sort of in the context and during the time of, of COVID as we sort of figure out like how and what coping looks like. Uh, during this time. So, you know, by way of background, I'm a social psychologist. So I study, uh, you know, sort of people in general. Um, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I don't study individuals, right? I study sort of what fundamental things underlie all of us. Uh, and so, you know, obviously it's been a very uh, interesting time to be a behavioral scientist. I have lots of people, you know, are paying new attention to their behaviors and their feelings and emotions because of COVID, right? Um, and so, you know, it's been a unique opportunity to talk about sort of how and why uh, are we able to sort of persevere during times of change like this. So uh, the reason that Sally in, uh, invited me is I had written an article about sort of the limitations of various kinds of coping strategies and how we sort of blend them together to get to a good place. So let me sort of review a little bit of what we know from the science and then we can talk a little bit about sort of some active strategies that you can engage in uh, during this time to help make sure that you're staying in a mentally healthy place. So one of the studies that I talked about uh, in the article that, that Sally liked was uh, one of my favorite studies on facial feedback. So it's a very simple study. Um, the basic idea is that we have you reading cartoons and then rating how funny you think those cartoons are. Um, and, but you're in two different condi uh, conditions. So some of the people um, are, are asked to hold a pen and I didn't, I didn't have a pen right near me, so I'm gonna use my, my remote are asked to hold a pen with their lips, right? Now, if you can imagine holding a pen with your lips while you do this task, um, and it had a cover story for why, you can turn around like this. The other half were asked to do it with their teeth. Ah, like this, and I hold it like this, All right? Now, one of the interesting things that happens when you hold a pen that way is when you hold it with your lips, it naturally pulls your muscles down into a frown, right? Uh, title of the article and where was it published, please. I will happily follow up with the citation uh, later on, uh, Debbie, if you remind me, it's a little hard to do in the middle of a talk, but, um, so, uh, it pulls your facial muscles down into a frown, right? Uh, you also, but when you hold it with your teeth, right, a different thing happens. You kind of pull your facial muscles up into something, mimic it. Uh, oh, there you go. Sally's going to post it. Uh, something mimicking a smile, right? And so as you might imagine, when people are pulled down into a frowning position, they don't think that the cartoons are very funny. 
right? But when they're pulled up into a smiling position, right, they actually rate the cartoons dramatically funnier. Now, why this matters in a, in a time of COVID is the, the, the fundamental point is that the way that we act influences our emotions. We often have sort of a, a reverse paradigm for this. We think of sort of like, I have an emotional reaction and that drives action, which is true, but, but it's reciprocal. It's a two-way street, right? So my behaviors also drive my emotions, right? Um, this is what makes depression so pernicious, right? Depression robs you of your, of your animus, your energy to sort of like get out of bed in the morning. But then as you lay in bed in the morning, that makes you more depressed, right? Because laying in bed and doing nothing and feeling like you can't get up and start your day is in fact depressing on its own, right? And so there's this cyclical loop. And so one of the things that we can try and do is change our emotion, right? We can sit here and try and cognate, um, you know, think about how we're feeling, you know, talk about how we're feeling to other people, but that has, you know, sort of limits to its efficacy. Uh, another route to changing our emotional reactions, changing our mental state is actually to change our behaviors, right? Smiling more literally helps you to survive rough times, right? And so one of the lessons that we can draw these days is actually working on controlling our behaviors in such a way as to change our emotional reactions and our emotional sort of labile um, this during this time. Quit waving your hand around, it's making me nervous. <laughs> I can't do anything about that. I talk the way I talk. I'll try and keep them out of view over here. Um, so that is, a, I, no one has ever asked that on a telecall. Um, so uh, the, the first thing I want you to think about is sort of behavior can guide emotion, but there are limitations to that, right? It would be crazy foolhardy to say to you all, hey, during COVID, you know, just grin and bear it, right? If you just smile your way through it, everything will be okay. That's obviously not true. Humans are social creatures. We're made to be around other people. We can't do that right now. Like, you know, this goes against very core things that are inbuilt, you know, we pass on through our DNA, literally, you know, the ability to socialize with other people. Uh, it's one of the just defining characteristics of what makes us humans. We're sort of, we're pack animals, we're herd animals. And so, you know, not being able to do that um, is incredibly important, right? Um, Stop looking instead, listen as if it's fine. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you, we're welcome to shut off my video. That's pretty easy. Um, I like this. We have like, we're like live solving the problems of a stream right now. Um, hold on, someone is pinging me because they think I'm in something else. All right, um, so uh, one of the things you can do is your behavior that obviously has limitations. So I wanna bring up another study, right? that is a more cognitively based. So a second study that I talked about, and I think the answer for COVID lives somewhere between these two studies, is uh, one of the lovely torturous studies that we social psychologists tend to run. Uh, we seem to enjoy teasing people for a living. And so we take people who are restricted eaters, they're trying to eat healthy, right? they're dieting, and we ask them to carry around chocolate all day long. Right. And so you can think about that. This is sort of a, a rather annoying task for people who are trying not to eat a bunch of chocolate and then you make them, them, you know, them carry the chocolate around. You know, it's hard. Right. It's sort of emotionally racking for them. And so they're given one of three sets of instructions. Right. So one group is told. And again, yes, I'll cite this at the end. Uh, one group is told nothing. Right. They're just carry around the chocolate. Try not to eat it. That's sort of like the end of their instructions. And then, you know, the dependent measure is how much chocolate they actually eat, right? So there's a group that's told nothing. There's another group that is told essentially to suppress their urge for the chocolate, right? So when you start feeling, you know, the urge to push the chocolate, actively push that down, right? Actively resist eating it um, and, and try that as a strategy. And a third group is told when you have the craving for chocolate, um, accept it, right? Recognize it, recognize that you have it like allow yourself to feel those feelings, just don't act on them, right? This is sort of a, an acceptance and commitment based sort of intervention. And as you might imagine, no instructions turns out relatively badly. If you make people who are trying not to eat chocolate carry around chocolate and you give them no instructions, they tend to eat the chocolate, right? Because they are, you know, sort of confronted by this urge at all moments and it's highly available to them. What is interesting is that the other two conditions uh, what actually works is a hybrid between the two, right? They each have their unique moments where they work and don't work. So push it down, ignore those feelings, actually is not terrible advice some of the time, right? When you have lots of free cognitive resources, when you're feeling your best, you're 
well fed and well slept, et cetera, it's actually relatively easy to put aside some cravings or emotions. We do that regularly and routinely throughout our lives, right? Anytime we concentrate on a task, your body at the moment, as you're listening to me talk, you're literally bombarded by all the other things you could be doing, right? Like there's a temptation to leave and go, you know, watch a movie. There's a temptation to leave and go have lunch, right? There's a, um, there's a million other things you could be doing. And as a routine part of being human, you actually suppress those urges, right? You are able to attend to the fact that I'm talking. So suppression in and of itself is not a bad strategy. The problem is suppression tends to break in moments when we are not at our best, right? When we're stressed, for me, hunger is a big trigger, right? That, that inhibits my cognitive resources. You know, sleep, all of those kinds of, you know, sort of, stressors on our lives tend to degrade our ability to suppress things, right? And so it's in those moments that those acceptance-based therapies actually tend to work the best, right? These moments when we accept how we're feeling, we recognize it, we allow ourselves not to sort of, you know, avoid or distract, but rather to sort of, you know, fully recognize and experience that moment, but then commit to not practicing a behavior on top of it. I'm going to acknowledge my urge for this chocolate, but I'm not going to eat it. Right? Because again, as we learned from the first study, behavior really matters. Ultimately, when we're talking about you know, sort of resilience during COVID, it is very hard to judge people's emotional state. Right? We can self-report it. We can you know, sort of interrogate how we're feeling. But ultimately, we are a collection of actions. And it is usually actions that we're trying to control. When people say, hey, I'm really trying to be healthy, what they mean is I'm trying to work out or I'm trying to eat in a particular way or sleep in a particular way or do particular things or not do particular things, right? Like smoking. There are a whole pattern of behaviors that people are constantly trying to address. And even though we label them as cognitive, we label them as emotional, right? It is the behaviors themselves that tend to matter. So I'll take a pause there. Are the, do the two studies kind of make sense, right? So you have one study that is encouraging you to you know, consider using your behaviors as a way to change your emotional states, whether that's smiling or, or any kind of other thing. And then in another study, it's looking at how your cognitions, your feelings, emotions, your strategies, you know, about your thoughts change your behaviors, whether that's suppression and distraction. Hey, I'm going to distract myself from that feeling. I'm going to, you know, choose not to dwell on it, right? We all know the sort of shy spiral that can happen when you dwell on something. Um, uh, experiential, yeah, experiential acceptance, right? The idea that I'm having an, so Sally, Sally sort of pointed out, like, what is this thing, right? So experiential acceptance is the idea that I am, I am recognizing, you know, my experience. I'm accepting it. One of the really things that's key to it is valid, right? We have this tendency to self-invalidate, right? It's not okay for me to feel the way I'm feeling right? That's not an acceptable response to whatever this environment is. And so something like acceptance and commitment therapy and other kinds of strategies like experiment, experiential acceptance is this notion that all feelings are valid by mere dint of the fact that you're feeling them, right? The very fact that you feel what you feel means it is a reasonable reaction to that situation. You know that because you're feeling it, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's the reaction you want to have, right? It's not a uh, you know, we're not asking you to agree with the feeling, but we're asking you to recognize that you do in fact have it, right? For better or for worse, that is the experience that you are having. And so when you accept that you are having that experience, it becomes easier to then modify the behavior that comes out of that experience, right? When I accept the, ex the emotional experience that I'm having, I can then say, hey, I'm really upset right now, but I'm not going to go smoke a cigarette, right? I'm going to choose a different path for expressing that emotion, but I'm recognizing that I have the emotion. This is very different from distracting yourself from the emotion, for example, like, you know, oh, when I start to have those feelings, I'm just going to go play a video game or something that's going to sort of like, so I don't have to think about it or talk about it or, or, you know, engage with it with others. Right. So given that, let's talk a little bit about how you actually change behaviors in the world. Right. So for behavioral scientists like me, right. Um, first, let's unpack behavioral scientists, because in fact, all of you are behavioral scientists or have the capability of being behavioral scientists. All behavioral science is, is it's not a bunch of lab studies, right? It's not a knowledge of psychology and pedagogy, although that helps, right? What it is is a very simple framework. Putting behavior at the center of what you, of you build and do, and then using a science-based process to actually get that to occur, right? So one of my favorite examples, um, you know, I was interviewing somebody for a job and one of the canonical questions I tend to ask is, can you tell me about a time you changed yourself or someone else's behavior? You know, and often 
project managers and other people come up with very formal sounding versions of this. You know, they'll talk about some product they built or et cetera. But one of my favorite answers was from a young woman who said, well, I was really annoyed that my roommates never rinsed out their wine glasses, right? They like would drink wine, they leave them on the table, you know, the red wine dries at the bottom and then, you know, it's impossible to get your hand in there and you have to really scrub it out and it's quite annoying, right? And so that bothered me. And then she talked about a series of strategies that she had engaged in to attempt to get her, her roommates uh, to change their behavior, right? And so first, she put behavior right at the focus, right? She didn't say, I'm annoyed at my roommates because they're bad people, right? She said, there is this behavior that I want to change, right? It is agnostic of the people. It is agnostic about judgments about the people. It's just a thing I want, I want them to do differently in the world. And this same tactic, by the way, applies to ourselves, right? When you put those Oreos on the top shelf instead of the bottom shelf, you're ch attempting to change your own behavior. You're saying, I know that when they're on the top shelf, it'll be harder for me to reach. And so I'm less, less likely to do that. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and so then there's that second word, science, right? And this is the key part of what that young woman did, right? It was about finding and testing interventions, right? Saying, well, I tried getting a bottle brush and I saw whether that or not that worked, right? I tried putting up a reminder sign and I saw how well that did or didn't work, right? It's testing more than one thing uh, and then seeing does it have the impact that I want. Right? In a formal context, we do this through measurement, but you can do it informally at home with yourself. Right? You can you know, sort of very easily put a, a line on the sort of M&M jar and say, okay, well, how far did it go down this week? Right? And look at what happens when you put it on the top shelf instead of the bottom shelf. Right? Um, so we are all capable of behavioral science. When we put behavior at the focus and we use a science-based process, the same thing you learned in eighth grade, right, to do so, then you become a behavioral scientist. You empower yourself to go do that work. And so how should we think about behavior? Well, for a social psychologist like me, we talk about competing pressures, right? So promoting pressures, reasons to do something, inhibiting pressures, reasons to not do something. Uh, since I talked about M&Ms, actually, let's use my, you know, my favorite canonical example. Why do we eat M&Ms? Uh, this is not a rhetorical question, by the way, like I expect to see some things appear in chat. Why do we eat M&Ms? Sally, you're also allowed to participate. <laughs> Everyone's asleep on me. They are around. Great. They're fun to eat. So, uh, so Sally, I'm going to go back to they are around. I want you to come back to they are around, right? Because I'll challenge that and say, well, this is, you know, this remote is around, but I ain't eating it, <laughs> right? The mere availability does not tend to make me want to eat something, <laughs> right? As Sharon said, they're fun to eat, right? They actually have something we call mouthfeel in the sort of food science world, right? They are small, they're crunchy, right? You actually like literally like the sort of um, textural taste of something, right? Tofu is a really great example. It doesn't really have a taste, but people, it doesn't have great mouthfeel. It doesn't have crunch to it. It's kind of sort of, you know, mushy. And people are actually reacting against that mouthfeel more than they are actually taste, although they may identify it as taste, right? So M&Ms have great mouthfeel. That's a promoting pressure. They taste great, right? Susan is 100% right. Pamela, you're like, it's absolutely about delicious. Right. And M&Ms knows this. this is why they have over 30 flavors at this point. You know, they just released jalapeno M&Ms, which we all know is foolhardy, right? The pinnacle to which an M&M aspires is a peanut butter M&M. The peanut butter M&M is the best possible uh, future for M&Ms and all the other flavors don't matter. Um, so, you know, they keep releasing flavors because they know taste is a powerful promoting pressure. Barbara's right, right? There's a rush that goes along with chocolate that we actually, you know, release chemicals in our brain that responds to chocolate and sugar that make us feel good. There's also sort of, I'll, I'll sort of expand that to a, there's a hunger piece to that. You know, um, think about Snickers, right? Snickers has, you've never seen a Snickers campaign that said, Snickers, we taste better than M&Ms, right? They don't compete on taste, right? They're certainly not competing on appearance, right? Somebody said small and colorful. That's absolutely true, by the way. If we, if I give Sally a bowl of just, you know, sort of blue M&Ms, she will eat dramatically fewer than if I give her the whole mix, right? We are primarily attracted to the variety of colors, even though we all know they don't actually have different flavors, right? Like we can look around, like I love the fact that all of us have a favorite M&M color, even though we're like logical adults and know that they're not Skittles and know that there's no actual flavor associated with them. I still kind of like the chocolate looking one better than the other ones. Uh, you know, it, it, we are primarily attracted to those colors. Um, and so you never hear Snickers say, well, we look better than M&Ms, right? If you've ever seen Caddyshack, obviously, like the floating pool example, right? A Snickers is not better looking than an M&M, right? But um, what Snickers does compete on is actually caloric content, right? Snickers, peanuts for power, 
Snickers, it satisfies. They leaned into the toy. I'm hangry. You, ha you aren't yourself if you haven't had a Snickers, right? Um, you know, they have that great, you know, uh, Betty White commercial, right? Where, you know, she's some, a, a football player turns into Betty White until they have their Snickers and then they sort of get better, right? Like it is that, that notion of caloric content that they actually go off. So there's many promoting pressures. Brand is really important, right? All of those are other sort of things, right? But I will venture to guess that the majority of the, you know, 80 odd people that we have on this are not eating M&Ms right now. Why not? Right? There are these inhibiting pressures that push back. Why are we not eating M&Ms? Right? You just told me they're delicious and, you know, they're a guilty pleasure, right? Susan's right. They have some, some emotional context. They have brand associated with them. They're, you know, chocolate things. Amy, too much sugar, right? So health. Health is a powerful inhibiting pressure, right? That, you know, we talk about those COVID-19 that people are, get, you know, gaining at home because they're around food all the time, right? You know, availability is a powerful pressure. So earlier, you know, uh, uh, Sally said, you know, they're around. I won't eat something just because it's around. I'm not going to eat this, this remote just because it's around. What around means is it's the removal of an inhibiting pressure. Given that it's delicious, given that it's colorful, given that it's chocolate, availability is very powerful. We know, for example, in a study that, um, you know, if I put a small bowl of candy on your desk, you will consume dramatically more candy than if it's as little as 10 feet away across the room, right? If I put it on, you know, sort of a shelf across the room, you're just not as likely to sort of aimlessly go for it. Now, keep in mind, the candy hasn't changed. It is exactly as colorful, exactly as delicious as it always was, right? It's merely that I've added inhibiting pressures to make it harder to do, right? And so, it, if we think about behavior change, what we're thinking about is we never actually change behavior itself. We change the pressures that create behavior. We make something more delicious or move it farther away, right? In order to, to manipulate our own reactions to those things in our environment, right? As Stuart sort of pointed out, right? Like what is the m and slogan? Melts in your, not in your, right? That is an inhibiting pressure statement, right? There are lots of things that, you know, well, don't melt in my hand, right? But what made M&Ms distinctive among chocolate, this is actually the story of the founding of M&Ms, by the way. M&Ms actually um, came from the founder of M&Ms saw, uh, 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 God, uh, what is the British version called? This is what happens. Why is why I don't give talks in the morning? Uh, whatever the British version of it. Smarties. There we go. So Smarties, right, are British M&Ms, right? They're little chocolate candies. They actually predated M&Ms. And so the, the founder of Mar Mars saw um, uh, soldiers eating M&Ms during the Spanish Civil War or eating Smarties during the Spanish Civil War. He said, huh, that's an interesting wartime food. And so during World War, uh, during World War, he, you know, chocolate was rationed. M&Ms were actually not sold to the consumer public. They were sold to the military as part of MREs, right? They were the dessert in Meals Ready to Eat because chocolate and all these other things that more readily melted, et cetera, didn't, weren't shelf stable, right? We didn't have air conditioning at the time, right? So M&Ms literally exist because of inhibiting pressures. They're not the most delicious thing in the world, but they do not melt. And that has unique characteristics in the world, right? So they're not around. Barbara says she doesn't have any. There's too much sugar. There's a caloric thing, right? Um, you know, there's all sorts of inhibiting pressures that, you know, no one's mentioned it, but they cost money, right? They're not free, right? And we may, uh, living in somewhat privileged Western society, we may not think of the cost of M&Ms as high, right? But, you know, think about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? He gets one chocolate bar a year right? Millions and millions of people around the world live on less than a dollar a day, right? So the cost of M&Ms is actually, you know, a primary inhibiting pressure in many contexts, right? Um, and there are even things that are on the bottom, you know, on this promoting pressure side that become inhibiting pressures in other contexts. This contextual piece matters, right? Cost may matter more for someone who's out of work than for someone who's not, right? Brand is another great example, right? There are moments the M&M &M brand is totally appropriate, right? They're fun, they're childlike, right? They're associated with kids and outdoors and, you know, going to the ballpark and, you know, other kinds of things that are sort of fun related. But there are moments that same brand can flip on the other side, right? I could say, Sally, you know, it's, it's, it's um, Valentine's Day, you know, sitting down for a romantic dinner, candlelight, filet mignon, little red wine, and for dessert, M&M. Right? That's not an M&M's moment. That's a lint moment. That's a dark chocolate moment. Right? That's, that's a dove moment. Right? So M Mars has brands that are associated with those more serious moments. And then they have M&M's, some of the funner moments. Right? And so there are, there are 
context in which things may be more appropriate. There are differences between people in which things may be more appropriate. So what does this all have to do with COVID? If we think about COVID resilience as being about behaviors, about a pattern of behaviors that we want to have or not have, right? Avoiding overeating, making sure we're exercising, avoiding smoking, making sure we're socializing, right? What we can do is start to manipulate our behaviors by changing the pressures that actually act on them, right? A great example of this, I love my family. I love my family. I've always loved my family. Nothing about COVID has made me love my family more than I did previously, right? It's not a promoting pressure problem. But I now play pinnacle with my parents and my brother every Tuesday night, right, because of COVID. Um, you know, there was that additional desire to have bonding, right? So there's that additional promoting pressure. But then in order to make it easy, right, in order to stick to that new habit, it's all about removing inhibiting pressure. It's on my calendar. It has a reoccurring Zoom invite. You know, my brother found a place online that was relatively easy to play. You can imagine a world where that wasn't true, right? Like, imagine if we tried to, like, point our, our webcams down and, like, you know, played with physical cards, right? We probably would drop that fairly fast, no matter how much I love my family, no matter how much additional bonding I want, right? If those inhibiting pressures are too high, then you will, the new behavior won't stick, right? So when you think about a behavior that you'd like to change as part of your sort of COVID resilience plan, I think you need to think about consciously and explicitly, right? All right, what promoting pressures can I use, right? How can I make this, you know, something that is more likely to occur? And what inhibiting pressures can I remove, right? Um, or vice versa, there may be behaviors that you want to eliminate as part of this, right? You know, not having candy around may be a wise thing during COVID if you're trying to eliminate, you know, your sort of candy eating behavior. And underlying this is actually uh, a sort of key unstated assumption, which is that you are conscious and cognitive about the behaviors that you want to change. This is not always true, right? We don't often think about the behaviors. We think about the negative downstream effect of our behaviors. But we don't often think about the behaviors that we want to structurally uh, replace or or um, remove or create, right? It's very rare that we sit down and consciously articulate, hey, I want to make sure that I blank all of the time or I want to do it twice a week or whatever it is. Making sure that you're conscious and articulate about the behaviors that you're wanting to create as part of your COVID resilience is really key, right? It isn't that we like randomly stick things in our mouths to smile more, right? Like these things are planned. They're careful, right? I want to put time on my calendar to connect with people, right? It's not enough to say, well, I want to connect with people in general. You need to go build the systems that allow that to occur. And so, you know, I don't think it is so simple as grin and bear it. I don't think it's so simple as suppress. I don't think it's so simple as, you know, just get on through. I think we need to be conscious, cognitive, thoughtful about how we create and change behavior in the world. We need to know what behaviors we want to change, and then we want to create systems that create that change, right? And whether that's empty calories or whether it's connecting with people more, I think we, we have to be thoughtful in our pursuit of behavior change. So as I think about sort of COVID resilience and how we sort of get through this time in the world, the first step is being really conscious and articulate about the behaviors that you want to change, right? What are you doing that you want to stop doing? What are you not doing that you want to start doing, right? Then you need to be very deliberate. And I mean, literally take, take a piece of paper, draw an up arrow, right? For promoting pressures, a down arrow for inhibiting pressures and actually list out those pressures, right? Be thoughtful about like, here are all of the things that, that tend to cause this to occur. Here are all the things that tend to, you know, sort of uh, 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 make this less likely. And then how are you gonna go consciously uh, uh, manipulate those? We actually do this, by the way, we draw it out for very specific reasons. Uh, it turns out we have a bias as humans. So when I want to do something more, I naturally gravitate towards promoting pressures. There's this natural tendency to think about rewards, right? You know, if I want to make myself work out more, right, I'll, you know, sort of, if for every hour I work out, I can play an hour of video games. I'll make myself a bargain with rewards, right? We very seldom tend to structurally think about the inhibiting pressures. We tend to ignore those. Vice versa, by the way, when we're trying to eliminate a behavior. So smoking is the canonical example, right? We put in place lots of inhibiting pressures for smoking. We made it very expensive with taxes. You have to be over 18. You can only get them in a store, right? Remember when I was a kid, you used to be able to just like literally go up to a vending machine, put in some quarters, pull a thing, get a pack of cigarettes, right? We've made it very hard, right? Uh, particularly harder in COVID, right? Cigarettes are one of the few things that can't be delivered, right? You have to go out into the world, expose yourself to, to a pandemic in order to get cigarettes, right? But it isn't the only thing that we did to beat smoking in this country, right? One of the primary things we did is you can't advertise cigarettes, right? Not in movies, not in magazines, not on TV. We, there is no more Marlboro Man. There is no more Joe Camel, right? 
we actually removed the reason that people smoke in the first place because almost certainly people don't take their first cigarette because cigarettes are super fun, right? They take their first, their first cigarette because they want to look cool, right? And so when we remove the things that make it look cool, we actually can change those behaviors so we can remove promoting pressures. So when you're thinking about stopping doing something during COVID or avoiding a behavior, it's really important to think about like, why am I doing that behavior in the first place? Is it a way that I am, you know, dealing with nervousness? Okay, well then I need to replace it, you know, with some other stress related, you know, stress relief behavior. Is it because, you know, like I always do the same thing at the same time? Well, great, can I ha how can I interrupt the clock of that, right? Looking at those promoting pressure factors and removing them structurally is a key part of how we change our behaviors, you know, when we want to remove things. So, and then finally, right, so we've now, been very conscious and explicit about the behaviors we want to change. We very consciously and explicitly said, here are all the things that make that behavior more likely. Here are all the things that make that behavior less likely. And then the last piece is that experimentation, right? It's starting to consciously experiment with what happens when you manipulate those pressures. Okay, I'm, you know, I, I always smoke at the same time. What intervention can I do? And then does that intervention actually work, right? Does that intervention actually pull away um, when we do that? Uh, and so, you know, monitoring your own behavior enough to be able to say, hey, am I smoking more or less? Am I eating more or less? Am I exercising more or less? I don't think this has to be a quantified self-pitch. I don't think we should all be tracking all of ourselves everywhere we go. But I do think that like being sort of um, uh, conscious of that makes sense. So Michelle asked, you know, how do you control something that are really closely, you know, sort of what we call pub Pavlovian behaviors, the idea that two stimuli are very closely associated, right? Like, you know, I, I turn on, I, so when I sit on the couch, I turn on the television. When I turn on the television, I eat food, right? Well, there's a variety of ways that you can actually go, go interrupt those. A lot of it is about changing the cycle of that particular behavior, the routine or habit of that particular behavior, right? Even moving your TV, moving your couch, right? Changing when you watch something, right? So they can be time rate related behaviors. I, you know, I'm going to, do it right after I just ate a meal so I'm not as hungry, right? I'm gonna change the, the where and the how and the when and the why of, of doing it is the best way to interrupt sort of can, what we think of as conditioned behavior. When you say Pavlovian behavior, we say conditioned behavior, right? The idea that you know some stimulus then leads to, to something. We need to, to interrupt that. You can either interrupt it, you can also replace it, right? So if you can do something you know, sort of religiously for you know, 10 to 15 days, you can often replace those behaviors. So when I sit on the couch, I get a glass of water, right? That can be a replacement behavior for I get some food, right? And if you could do that reliably over enough, you know, a, a frequent enough period of time, you actually start to replace those behaviors, right? You start to replace those things. Um, all change in behavior requires change in the environment, right? It is very hard to just cognate yourself into that, right? And so, you know, how do I make the food less proximal to the, to the TV, right? Where is the, you know, let's say, for example, we're trying to interrupt, I eat M&Ms when I watch TV. Great. So my TV is in my living room. I'm going to put my M&Ms like in the garage, right? I'm not throwing them out, which could be hard, right? I, I might just buy more. I have M&Ms, but they're so far away that getting up and getting them is a major pain in the ass, right? Like that is a very effective way of changing people's behavior, right? So you can interrupt those Pavlovian responses by changing the environment. Because it isn't just by the, you know, it isn't just the association TV M&Ms, right? It's a whole routine. The M&Ms are always in this cupboard. Even literally moving them from this cupboard to that cupboard can like interrupt my, you know, my sort of, my sort of behavior. Um, you know, it, it's a whole series of actions. You know, when we look at drug addiction, it isn't, you know, people's brain responses to the drug actually occur before the drug ever hits their body, right? It's a response to the act of heating it up the, in the spoon, the act of putting it in the syringe, the act of doing the thing. Even if they inject themselves with saline, they get a huge portion of that, of that sort of uh, drug rush from the mere routine that is now associated with that drug rush. And so you know, interrupting anything in your environment is a great way to interrupt behavior. Um, for people who have a low hum of anxiety during the pandemic, uh, do I have advice? Uh, I mean, first of all, that is a reasonable and valid way to react to a pandemic, right? Feeling anxious is not an unusual reaction to a pandemic. One would argue, that, in fact, that like, you know, only, only sort of, you know, neuro non-typical people would feel non-anxious in this environment, right? I would be more worried. I'm more worried about the people who feel no anxiety than the people who feel lots of anxiety, right? Because, you know, in many ways, it's, those are the people who are not wearing masks. Those are the people who are sort of not doing these things. 
you know, they're not appropriately recognizing uh, the, the potential threat. So I think rather than making the goal not feeling the anxiety, I think it's a matter of what do you do with that anxiety, right? How do you give voice to it? What does it change in your behavior? How are you recognizing it? How are you letting it affect you? So rather than like, what do you do about feeling anxiety? I always ask people to think about like, well, what are the, how do you know you're anxious, right? How do you know you're anxious? And people will say, well, I, you know, I'm biting my nails or I'm not sleeping well. Okay, great. So then let's not talk, let's not talk about anxiety. Let's talk about not sleeping well. Let's talk about, you know, biting your fingernails. Let's talk about whatever the instantiation of that anxiety is, right? Because again, going back to our grin and bear it, if you can modify the anxious behavior, like, you know, it's in a feedback loop with your anxiety. And so if you can modify that anxious behavior, if I can get you sleeping well, even though you're feeling anxious, you actually start to feel less anxious, right? Um, and so focusing on the behavior, I think, Sally, is, is a really key portion of how do you go and, go and do that work. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So um, let's just see if there's some, a few additional questions, Matt. This is really fascinating. So either, either type them into the chat or I guess type them in the chat or the Q&A. I saw that Michelle had added a question there. Yeah, and I will send out citations, you know, you know, for the, for the studies, like that's not a problem. Those are easy to, to I, do. I recall, I recall, Matt, in the article that you wrote, when grin and bear it is not the right answer, um, you said that you said that there was really kind of a hybrid approach around experiential acceptance and then sometimes putting on a smile. Maybe you could just kind of summarize what you think the key advice might be based on that, based on the research in that article. Yeah, I mean, I think that the 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 blend is ex recognizing and accepting your feelings, but then, you know, finding uh, uh, the happy medium of behaviors that, that may feel, uh, they may feel like you're ignoring your feelings, but I don't think they are, right? I think saying, hey, I'm feeling really anxious right now. I'm going to go distract myself with a little bit of video games, right? Is, that's very different than trying not to think about feeling anxious and, and then, you know, compensating with playing video games. There's a difference between sort of like, I recognize how I'm feeling and I accept that. And then I'm going to take a conscious strategy to go deal with that. Right. Um, versus like, you know, sort of, I'm not feeling that I'm not anxious. I'm not, you know, like trying to push those things away. Um, and so I think that they're, you know, that's the happy medium is the sort of, I am feeling sad. I'm going to choose to smile right? I'm going to, I'm going to consciously take an action that helps me feel a little bit better. Right. Um, Barbara, Barbara asked how to deal with anger. Um, you know, so, you know, if, if, you, if, and Barbara, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, right, there are lots of people who are used to suppressing anger. Right. And so the, the, emotional experience of anger and the physical experience of anger, right? Your blood gets up, like those sorts of things, like is it intensely uncomfortable for them? Feeling angry doesn't usually feel good, right? It feels negative if you were used to suppressing anger. Um, you know, it's a, it's a totally interesting question, Barbara, because, um, you know, it isn't clear that anger is a negative emotion. It isn't clear that anger is bad for humans, right? Indeed, going back to our earlier example, you know, like someone who's not nervous during COVID, like people who don't seem to express or, or report feeling any anger have significantly worse health outcomes, right? As with most things, you kind of want to be in that middle zone. You don't want to be angry all the time. You don't want to never feel anger, right? That's, that's sort of equally problematic. The important part is, is how do you deal with that experience, right? That, that discomfort that anger brings on for you. Um, you know, one thing that you can do um, is you can use um, fundamental misattribution of arousal to your advantage. So what does that mean? So there's a great study, um, which I think I have enough time to talk about, um, where uh, you, you are hiking across a bridge, uh, and this is done with men, heterosexual men. Uh, you're hiking across a bridge, at the other end is an attractive female. She gives you a survey, and then she says, hey, if you want the results of the survey, here's my number, give me a call, right? And so we track, do men call this attractive woman? But there's two conditions, right? One, the bridge you just crossed is right above the ground, right? This was done in Canada at a, at a national park, right? It's like above like, you know, it's two feet off the ground. It's just like a little bridge is a small ravine. The other one is quite high up and quite rickety, right? Like it is a scary emotional experience that will absolutely get your blood rate up and stuff. So 
The question is, who calls more? Well, it turns out the people on the rickety bridge actually call the woman more often. Why? Because they're, they're misattributing their arousal. They're misattributing what they're feeling. So my blood pressure is up, right? Like I'm feeling anxious, nervous, flushed, et cetera, because I just went through this very scary experience, which was going across this rickety bridge, across this high ravine. And I misattribute that to, oh, I must be attracted to this, to this young woman, right? They misattribute that to something else. Uh, this is why, for example, like spicy food is often eaten on dates, you know, scary movies are date movies. Why? Well, spicy food, again, gets your blood pressure up, your temperature goes up, mimics arousal responses, so sexual arousal responses. Same thing in fear, right? Like fear makes me, you know, the body feeling of fear is the same body feeling we have around sexual excitement. And so people have traditionally used those, right, to manipulate how they feel about their date. Um, so you can use that to your advantage, Barbara. In engaging in things that allow you to express those same anger, uh, so to, to bleed off some of those anger physical reactions through another thing can actually be quite, quite helpful, right? So this is why working out is a great way to process through anger. Um, I'm a boxer, right? So like any kind of anything that, you know, mimics the ability to sort of get that heart rate going and, and, and lets you have those other kinds of experiences um, can be really, really important. And so I think, you know, my best answer for coping with anger right now is looking at how do you process anger like physiological things and get comfortable with that state of physiology, which then allows you to, you know, sort of deal with the anger separate from I'm not used to sort of physiologically feeling this way, right? Because when the two are combined, it's often overloading, right? Taking time, stepping away, allowing some of those physiological things to fade or giving yourself a chance to attribute those physiological things to something else. I'm going to work out for a bit, right? And then sort of come back to it, right? Um, one, I think the most, one of the most successful strategies for fighting is go away and work out a bit and then come back together and have a talk, right? Because the, work, the working out sort of bleeds off. It's not just taking time away. It's literally bleeding off some of the physiological things that you're, that you're, that you're feeling. And the nice thing is, you know, your body then releases things that help you, you know, calm. We talk about a runner's high, right? So after you go on a long run, your body releases a bunch of endorphins and other things to make you feel okay during the run, right? The run is very stressful to your body. So it releases things to make you feel okay so that you're not feeling miserable through this run. Then when you stop running, you get all of the chemicals that are like, feel really good, but you stopped doing the thing that was making you feel bad. So you get this rebound effect. So after a workout is a great time to revisit a conversation in which you were arguing because you've sort of bled off all of the physiological stuff and you just have the, the sort of hormones that let you feel a little better. Matt, I see we have a, a few more questions. What I'm going to do now, because I want to, I want to allow um, for people who need to leave at, at 45 minutes after the hour, I'm going to share like uh, 30 seconds of what our next presentation is going to be. And then for anybody who can stay on, I see we still have a number of questions and uh, we'll go through those remaining questions. But let me just share um, our next presentation, that's going to be in two weeks. I'm really designed, uh, excited on August 12th to have Dr. Linda Sasser. She is a, an internationally recognized expert on memory and brain health. And she's going to be talking about pave your way to a better memory. And what I've found in Linda's presentations in the past is that they're educational, they're entertaining, and they're very, very practical. So I hope that you can uh, join us for that. So Matt, let me turn this back to you. And again, for people who need to leave, we understand that, but if you can stay on for a few more minutes, Matt, I appreciate you going through the remaining questions. Yeah, I think there's just this one, which is sort of how culturally based is the understanding of the relationship between emotion and behavior. Um, and just, you know, uh, uh, Debbie talks about the fact that in some cultures, um, people may not name behaviors, et cetera. This is true in both directions, by the way, right? Um, there, are, there are cultures that are much more emotionally sensitive. Um, and I mean that in the sort of like, like literal sensitivity, they understand, they have words for the gradients between emotions to much more depth than we tend to use in America. Americans often describe their emotions much like we describe primary colors. They're like, good, bad, you know, sad, mad, happy, right? Like this really like central color wheel of things, right? And they often struggle, uh, particularly white men um, struggle to sort of articulate things outside of that, you know, sort of the blend of emotions that one might feel or a more articulate version of emotions, right? Um, yeah, I certainly struggle with that. Um, and it's, it's one of the, you know, for those that don't know, you know, suicide rates among white males are quite high. 
one of the potential reasons for that is the inability of men to engage with emotional conversation, right? They, they literally don't know how to recognize things outside of the primary color wheel of emotion. This also occurs in other cultures, right? So um, we do have to be a little careful. Um, there's a little essentializing that goes on. Japan is the usually used example, right? Japan, Japanese actually have um, a, a vast and colorful emotional language. Uh, they just view, you know, sort of discussing it with others or sort of public expressions of it differently, right? So it isn't that they don't recognize the sort of like smooth gradient of emotions, but they've choos chosen a different way to engage with that in a public sphere. Um, but yes, I mean, our understanding of emotions are, is, is very culturally bound. You know, it's a little bit hard because our access to people's emotions is defined somewhat by language. Right, so if a language doesn't have some of the same emotional, you know, you know, the tonal language that we use to describe emotions, it's hard to know whether they, you know, is Matt just not actually experiencing that emotion, or is he unable to describe that emotion, right, in a way that we are able to sort of come across. Brain imaging around emotions is very sort of primitive, um, so it's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult question. You know, the focus that that I would focus on, you know, from sort of a personal growth perspective, is you're trying to get people to be more um, uh, conversant in emotions, right? So uh, able to recognize the nuance and shades or the conflicting emotions that they may be feeling at the same time, and then to practice using those with other people. But you want to meet people where they are, right? You know, if a white guy, you know, in your life says, I feel mad, you know, you don't want to invalidate that he's, that, that, that he's experiencing that, right? You want to guide him through a conversation that's helping him to, to nuance that, right? I also think um, when you talk about sort of like our understanding of emotion and behavior, you know, pattern sentences, like structure, right? Remember our promoting and inhibiting pressures, right? It's really fine to say like, hey, you know, Sally, let's pretend Sally's married to me, right? Like Sally, for the health of our relationship, I'd really like you to, you know, sort of engage with your emotions more, but you have to remove the inhibiting pressures to doing that, right? Like I may very much want to, I may have high promoting pressure, but if I don't know how to do that, that's very hard. Right. So using structural things can really help. One of them, you know, one of my favorites is the when you A, I feel B because C and what I'd really like is C. Right. So, you know, rather than saying, Matt, I really wish you helped out around the house more. I don't know what the fuck that means. Right. That can mean lots of things. Right. If Sally says, Matt, when you, you know, when you don't wash, when you let the dishes stack up in the sink, right, it really makes me feel sad because it makes me feel like you don't uh, appreciate the work that I do around the house. So what I'd really like is when you see dirty dishes to go ahead and wash them, right? You've identified the behavior that's triggering for you. You have explained your emotional reaction and then the cause of that emotional reaction, right? You've nuanced it. And then you said, okay, here's the behavior that I'd like instead, right? Uh, this is really key, I think, during COVID because most of us are sheltering with other people, right? And so there's this diet and we weren't, you know, this was not the bargain that we took on, right? When when Sally and I got married, right, the expectation was not that Sally and I would spend 24-7 in a fucking apartment together the whole time, right? Like that was not the bargain that we made, but we are now sitting in this new bargain, right? And so part of the stress of COVID is learning how to negotiate, to renegotiate that bargain, right? Um, and so uh, that I think was the, was the sort of like best um, sort of instantiation of, you know, communication, you know, fundamental respect, recognizing that everybody's doing, you know, struggling right now is also key. But really that when you, A, I feel like, what are the real actual behaviors you need me to change? Not just the sort of general emotional affect that seems to be happening. And then uh, one last question. I so know, I saw John ask what were the, the other so she tried lots of things. The thing that worked the best was a bottle brush, right? Like, you know, the annoying, the reason that people don't rinse out their fucking wine glasses is because like they are oddly shaped, right? It's very, very hard. There's actually a lovely study um, that looks at like basically how likely are people to clean different kinds of, of glassware. And it, it has a very linear correlation to how easy is it to get your hand in there, right? And so like, you know, I am always very, it's very careful about when I buy glasses to make sure that I get glasses that like I can get my hand all the way down to the bottom. Right. Cause that's like the dominant factor in whether I'm actually going to wash that glass or not. Right. Like, you know, you just look at something and you're like, ugh, I can't be pissed uh, right now. And so when you just like a two, you know, $2 bottle brush, you know, you just, right. Like made all the difference for the, for this, for this room house full of people.
So Matt, thank you so much. Today we learned about how to change behavior. We learned about different studies and we learned how to wash a wine glass. So it doesn't get much better than that. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you to all of our participants who joined us. And um, I, I appreciate your time. And, and what we will do is we'll send out information with the links and that will include some of the studies that Matt referenced. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Sally.